Okay, good morning, everybody. As usual, we're just giving it a second to let everybody get into the webinar. We have a really uh, interesting, exciting uh, presentation today. Uh, as usual, before we get into that, we will just do a few of our regular updates. Happy New Year to everybody. Hope everybody had a great break and is doing well. Uh, we certainly have a lot of things going on, as you all know, uh, regarding our pandemic uh, surge. And so we wanna make sure we get a lot of updates in as well. And of course, please ask any questions. We'll try to answer those for you live. And uh, any questions that can't be, we'll try to get those answered and send out as a follow-up as always. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Will Collins provide updates on the inpatient numbers of COVID. All right, can everybody see? Yes. Okay, so um, uh, I have a little bit of uh, a, a couple of things to go through here, so I'll try to get going. I'm gonna give the update uh, in terms of where we are with COVID-19. Um, so happy new year to everyone and thanks for having me again. And my screen will, there. Um, so just uh, once again, orient, orienting us first to um, numbers in the United States. So uh, this is showing new reported cases, new hospitalizations and deaths by day in the US. You can see that um, all three curves have some sense that they are, are leveling out a little bit. Um, which is good news, although um, around January 1st, we did pass now uh, over 20 million cases in the United States. And, and we still don't know exactly what's going to happen post holiday after the holiday travel season. Um, with regard to California, we're still um, very much in our surge here, maybe a little slowing um, there at the end of the curve of new positive cases. But we actually added over a million cases just in December alone in California, so still very much uh, on the upswing. And in the Bay Area too, um, still uh, continue to climb. This is uh, hospitalized patients with COVID-19 per 100,000. You can see that uh, the most prominent curve there is still Santa Clara, uh, the purple dotted curve. And when we look at uh, just ICU bed capacity, this is a little out of date, but it was the most up to date I could find. Um, it shows that uh, right now we're still at around seven or so percent uh, capacity for ICU beds in the county. Um, comparing that our non ICU bed capacity from the uh, public health department was at 11%. And then um, last I, I saw from the, the California D Department of Public Health, the, the Bay Area ICU capacity is at a um, about 5.9%. Um, looking at how Stanford compares to um, uh, the other hospitals in the county, um, again, I don't have the numbers for uh, the Palo Alto VA. Sorry, that was uh, brought up before. I'll see if I can get those in coming weeks. But you can see that uh, compared to other hospitals where we have information, um, we are definitely one of the, the higher in terms of census and certainly the highest in terms of uh, number of ICU patients. Um, I should uh, point out that this includes both uh, what we call COVID positive and COVID cleared patients. COVID cleared just means the patient has been in the hospital long enough that uh, they no longer are considered infectious and no longer require isolation precautions. Um, and when we look at our own numbers uh, week over week, you can see uh, very clearly now that um, this latest surge um, through December uh, to now definitely um, has uh, been our, our, highest, uh, our highest volume by far compared to any other time during this pandemic. Um, so as far as both positive cases and numbers no, hospitalized. Because they didn't, you know. Oh. No, I Okay. <laughs> um, and then um, when we look at our, our census, uh, you can see a similar trend in terms of um, uh, where we're at uh, with patients in the hospital as well as our ICU. Um, the, uh, excuse me, the, the boxes below basically break out um, from Monday and Tuesday what our numbers are uh, in more granular detail. So you can see that um, when you include both COVID positive and COVID cleared from the wards in the ICU, it was uh, a total of 128 on Monday, 120 Tuesday morning, and then last night it was down to 108. So we, we have had a little bit of drop in our numbers in the last few days, um, maybe a, a small bit of good news there. Um, with regard to transfers, so um, we've continued to take a number of transfers um, over the last two months. Um, since November 1st, we've had 47 COVID positive transfers, um, 28 of which came from other hospitals in Santa Clara County. Um, and then uh, as we spoke about uh, in the town hall over the break, um, we also have a, a mutual aid program that started uh, in early December. 
basically when um, another hospital is at an emergent or near emergent threshold for staffing ratios or just physical space to house patients, then we try to help out. Um, so we've now taken a total of 46 mutual aid transfers, uh, including 20 of which were COVID positive. Um, for our, our uh, adult demographics, um, so this is uh, now through January 3rd, um, you can see the numbers have definitely gone up. Um, we've now had a total of 1,237 patients between Stanford and Stanford Valley Care, of which over uh, 1,000 have been at uh, the Stanford Hospital in Palo Alto. Um, of that, uh, a little bit over 1,000, 1,014, still about 22% requiring ICU care, um, 57 deaths now identified. Um, just wanted to make sure we were uh, showing this breakout as well. So this is deaths both um, during the hospitalization or, short, or shortly after hospitalization within 30 days. So you can see that most of those deaths did occur during the index hospitalization, um, but there were eight that were uh, post-discharge, uh, six of which were within 10 days. Um, slightly more male than females in terms of uh, those who have passed away and, and the median age is 77.3. Um, overall, for our patients, uh, still slightly more female than male, actually, in terms of those who've been hospitalized. Uh, and then coming over to the right, you can see our age distribution. So um, pretty widely distributed, skews slightly older, which is expected, although still over 10% are 30 or under. Um, and then looking at race, that, excuse me, uh, race and ethnicity numbers, um, we still have a pretty disproportionate number of those who are Hispanic or Latinx, although um, now that number is less than 50% of the total. Um, so with this latest surge, we are seeing um, some burden across other ethnicities. And then uh, lastly, we wanted to look at length of stay for our uh, COVID-19 patients, uh, as well as readmission rate. So we were able to identify uh, 900 patients as of January 3rd who had a, a disposition or, or were discharged from the hospital. Um, and of those 900, um, you can see the range in length of stay is quite wide from uh, well less than a day to almost 65 days. Um, the median though is 4.1 with a mean of 6.8. So probably that mean is brought up by some longer length of stays. Um, and then when we looked at 30 day readmissions, so whether or not they'd had a readmission within 30 days of the initial hospitalization, uh, we saw 83 out of the 900, which is a rate of 9.2%. Um, and this is uh, looking at our length of stay over time. Uh, so basically looking at if there's been any significant change since uh, the start of the pandemic in terms of our average length of stay. And uh, I would ignore this drop in the curve here um, uh, on the far right. That's probably artificial related to um, the fact that we have to include only patients who have a discharge disposition. So it doesn't include our patients currently in the hospital. Um, but what you can see if you look at the rest of the curve is basically our length of stay has been roughly the same on average uh, through most of the pandemic. Um, so I wanted to thank uh, a lot of people who helped put together these numbers, um, names shown here, um, and I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to our next presenter. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Collins. And then move over to Dr. Uja to talk more about the inpatient surge response. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, and Will, thank you so much for that really informative aggregate data. Really helpful to see that all. Um, I wanted to wish everyone a happy new year. And really, I like to start with thanks. Usually I put this slide at the end, but I think it's really important for everyone to see how many people across so many different departments and within the department divisions, et cetera, have contributed both to the help and care of our COVID patients. And I will start off with really thanking our house staff uh, for this, as well as um, you know, our leadership. And many meetings have happened to try to you know, solidify the way that we will handle this surge. And it has been truly a very collaborative process. So thank you to everyone. I wanted to show a little bit about the current and surge uh, planning for the next eight weeks, because we are, as Dr. Collins just showed, uh, in for some high numbers. And in general, we have six medicine teams uh, that are hospitalist staff and a medicine consult service. We also have a nocturnist program that's a direct care service covering uh, 13 services across the Department of Medicine. We have our surgical co-management hospitalists who are helping with uh, surgical cases. And now that these cases have gone down, those hospitalists are being deployed to help with surge team coverage. Um, and then we have our valid care hospitals that are taking care of COVID patients and that's all direct care. 
But as we surge up, what we are looking at is activating. Right now we have two surge teams active. Each team has a cap of 20. And this is in addition to our existing ward teams. And while the caps on those ward teams could also be 20, just due to the very complex nature of these general medicine patients, the sweet spot for efficiency is closer to 16. However, with the COVID patients, because the care is really quite protocolized, um, there's a lot of similarities in the way that we care for these patients with the very close help of ID, we um, have increased that cap to 20. So we we'll have a cap of 20 for each service before we activate the next. And right now we're at two surge teams. But in preparing for the worst, we decided that we would plan for a total of eight uh, surge teams. And so every morning I send to the division chiefs with the help of our medicine chiefs who put the census together. Um, and this is actually this morning's data. So you can see you know, what the total census is and then where our surge teams are for the wards, um, you can see that right here. So once we get to a stable number of 20, we'll activate the next surge team. But what I also wanted to point out is really how busy our non-medicine services can be. You can see hematology here, they've reached their cap. Oncology has passed their cap of 15 and is accommodating um, some additional patients. Hepatology, the GI service, the same thing. And at times the CCU and cardiology services have been very busy. Med 9 and Med 11 are non-teaching oncology services and Med 11 just started on January 2nd, so we were happy to see that. And then as you see here, the ICU remains really tight. Um, you know, they have three surge teams activated and Dr. Weinecker um, asked me to briefly present on her behalf a few minutes ago. She's tied up with something, but she is on this call. So Anne, if you are able to chime in, if I say anything inaccurate, please let me know but you can see the total number of uh, MICU patients here and then the COVID ICU numbers here. And then this morning we had 92 total COVID patients in house. The COVID cleared as was mentioned by Dr. Collins are patients that are still in the hospital but have cleared the infectivity uh, standpoint. So as I mentioned, we want to prepare for you know, the extreme and if we don't have to utilize all eight surge teams that would be phenomenal. But we have to be very cognizant of the burden we place on our house staff in staffing these teams. And right now, team one and team two have really been exclusively staffed by our Department of Medicine house staff. So thank you, um, house staff, for, for your time in this. But I will really acknowledge Ron Wittellis and his leadership in his desire to protect your education and your training. And so with some very um, detailed negotiations and discussions with other departments and chairs under the leadership of Larry Katz Nelson and Ann Weinecker. We have come up with an agreement that you see here um, where other radio, uh, sorry, other residency programs will help staff these surge teams. And I put these slides together last night, but was just recently informed that actually ophthalmology will not participate uh, in the surge. So ENT will cover that. But otherwise, you know, the, the services you see here will help and pediatrics has also volunteered. So it's just nice to see so many people across the institution pitching in. Just briefly, there's a similar grid for up to eight surge teams in the ICU and their cap would be up to 15 patients. And you can see different services uh, staffing here and PEDS is PEDS critical care that would be able to help out. And just to give a brief you know, sense of the orientation that will be provided for both the house staff and the attendings and staffing that team, and I'll talk about the latter in a second, you know, there's quite a bit of work and I wanna acknowledge the folks listed here in their help in putting together all of this material because for those coming in from other departments, there will be a little bit of a learning curve, but we have asked that they stay on for a full week um, and that will help with the continuity of care. And as you look at our divisions across the Department of Medicine, I will say every single one of them have contributed in their own ways, including the non-clinical divisions, either through information or support or perspective. And um, you know, it really does take a village and I am so thrilled to see everyone stepping up. And so I thought I would show you how the ward staffing has happened. And it's really just been by volunteers. The, the division chiefs have helped uh, ask for this, and you can see many names across many uh, disciplines stepping up for these surge teams. 
I wanted to keep a little bit of a, a, a head, a lead way in staffing so that right now we're only at level two staffing, but we've got level three and almost all of level four staffing in place. Um, as you can see, actually, we do have level four staffing in place. And so we're almost done with level five. And that way, we'll, it's easier to deactivate people than to you know, scramble to find them. So I'm really appreciative of everyone's help. And I will stop here and turn it back over to you. And then finally, move it to uh, Dr. Pinsky for testing updates. Thank you and Happy New Year, everyone. I will try to be brief. Let me share my screen. Okay, there we go. Testing update. So the first thing is uh, our turnaround time numbers, which um, fortunately have improved since the last time I spoke. Um, this is on the Y axis collect to result and on the X axis, the various locations where specimens can be collected. And then uh, in black is the data from uh, prior to the winter break um, at the town hall in black. And then in gray is the um, data more recently ending on um, January 4th. Um, and it's the seven day average for these turnaround times. And you can see that uh, overall our turnaround times have uh, decreased quite substantially about, oops, about 15 hours or so. So we're right around 33 hours overall turnaround time for all of the nucleic acid amplification testing, uh, non-stat nucleic acid amplification testing. A lot of this has to do with reduced uh, turnaround time for ambulatory patients uh, getting collected at Galvez. Um, but also, as, as Brian mentioned, we have a new workflow for occupational health testing, and there's been uh, substantial improvements there as well, uh, down to about um, 11 or 12 hour turnaround time overall. Um, and then uh, we're maintaining the very high uh, level of turnaround times for stat testing, which is just around 70 minutes, and the urgent ED, to ED workflow, which is now down to about six and a half hours. Um, so overall, um, turnaround time is looking a lot better. This is due to a mul multiple numbers, multiple factors. Um, uh, we did implement a new uh, high throughput testing. Um, line that is up and running and uh, we're training folks on that. So that has really helped us with our turnaround time, but also uh, the numbers of tests have decreased a little bit over the holidays. Um, the pre-holiday uh, testing was around 17,000 tests for that week. And it was a little over 15,000 tests in the previous week. So a number of uh, factors there, but we think that we're on the right track for turnaround time. Uh, positivity rate um, is here, just showing positivity rates are overall increasing um, as consistent with all the other data that we've looked at so far today. Um, and then I was asked to briefly go over our, to switch gears, our, our IgG testing algorithm, our serologic testing. Um, so this slide has a lot of information on it. So let me go through. Um, hopefully in an organized fashion. So the tests that we're using are here on the right. Uh, we're using a Euroimmune IgG ELISA. Uh, and, and I'll talk about the different antigens that are used uh, because that becomes important with the various um, vaccines which are at the bottom. Uh, so this assay uses the spike protein S1 domain. We have an in-house ELISA that most of you have heard a lot about developed by Katharina Rotkin and uh, in Scott Boyd's lab that works extremely well. This is a spike protein receptor binding domain assay. And then um, Katharina and Scott also designed an ACE2 blocking assay. This is a competition ELISA that gives you a bit of an idea of the functional uh, capacity of these antibodies and their ability to block the interaction between the viral spike protein RBD and its receptor ACE2. Okay, so here's our algorithm. Uh, for sensitivity purposes, as well as throughput, we selected the Euroimmune IgG assay as our screening uh, IgG test. And then we break that down into three um, workflows. So if it's less than um, 0.8 ratio signal, uh, we report that as negative. A majority of our tests uh, for IgG are still negative. Um, if it's greater than 2.5, that's reported as positive, and then it automatically goes to ACE2 blocking. 
Um, so you'll see that in, in the results. And again, the ACE2 blocking is an assay that looks at the um, ability of the antibodies to block this interaction between RBD and ACE2. And it's similar to neutralization. Um, however, it's a little less sensitive than neutralization. And then the more complicated part is when we get into the borderline cases. This is between 0.8 and 2.5. Uh, for that, we do what the CDC calls orthogonal testing, though I'm not sure that's the right word. Um, and we perform a second RBD, uh, a second ELISA, uh, which is the RBD IgG. And the cutoffs there are 0.3. So less than 0.3, it's reported as negative, and greater than 0.3, it's reported as positive. So this is relevant for the various approved and authorized vaccines. Um, so the vaccines that we're using currently are the Pfizer and Moderna, they're the mRNA vaccines that encode the spike protein. So those of us that have been vaccinated and will be vaccinated will be detected by this algorithm. In addition, the Oxford and Sputnik vaccines, which are adenoviral vaccines, also encode the spike protein gene. So again, because these assays detect spike, uh, we will detect those, those individuals that have been vaccinated with those vaccines. Um, previously, we were using the Abbott assay that uses uh, uh, the nucleocapsid as um, antigen. So for those, for these vaccines, that assay is unlikely to, they, they won't detect um, the response to vaccination since N is not in those vaccines. And just for complete, complete sake, for those individuals that um, receive their vaccines out of the country, uh, the, the vaccine in China that's approved is Sinopharm, and in India it's uh, Bharat Biotech. These are inactivated whole virus, so it won't matter which ELISA is used to detect those individuals that have been vaccinated. So that's all I have for testing. Uh, thank you for inviting me again to present. I'm happy to answer questions on the chat. Great. Dr. Pinsky, thanks so much for the updates. And yeah, there's definitely a few questions there. So thanks so much as always, and all, all last year for helping with those questions. Um, I just want to, so Dr. Wood is our main presenter today. I just want to briefly say next week, we have a great presentation talking about our new mRNA vaccines. Uh, there'll be a lot of questions on. Um, this week, we're going to be talking about the psychology behind the rollout of the MR, of these vaccines and why people, uh, essentially the, the, the behavioral psychology behind it with Dr. Stacy Wood. Dr. Wood, I apologize. Uh, first off, thank you for all our, our, our updates, our really important updates and speaking of how uh, busy times are right now. We wanna make sure those updates come up, but Dr. Woods, I'm so sorry. Uh, we're cutting into your time a little bit. Um, definitely a very interesting uh, conversation you're gonna have today talking about red versus blue states uh, um, vaccine distribution. I just wanna briefly say a few things for about Dr. Wood. Uh, she has a PhD in marketing from the University of Florida. She is currently the Langdon Distinguished University Chair in Marketing for North Carolina State University. She's the Executive Director of the North Carolina State University Consumer Innovation Collaborative and the Senior Affiliated Scholar for Duke University since 2008. Um, she is very involved uh, with consumer innovation behavior. And I will let her, you, you'll get a, I imagine you get a better sense of that as she talks, but I just want to mention a few things. Uh, she's First off, a highly um, uh, busy uh, person uh, pub publicizing many, many, many articles looking at her CV. She has over 10 articles with 100 plus citations and thousands of citations. And this is as of uh, middle of last year. Um, and what was really interesting is looking at some of the stuff she's done and some of the work in progress. Dr. Wood, I, I, I'm already I'm excited. I was thinking last night looking at your CV, I'm already excited to invite you back for another grand rounds this year, looking at all the amazing stuff you're doing. She's looking at how the language used in tweets about cancer versus heart disease may impact patient choices. Uh, the behavioral analysis, uh, looking at our, our Duke Stanford uh, baseline study at Google, managing resources during medical crises, uh, improving physician persuasion techniques against viral misinformation, misunderstanding the impact of new technology on physician burnout, things that we are constantly dealing with and talking about all the time. So, um, and just, it's amazing how marketing and psychoanalysis, uh, sociology, all these things playing together. We were talking about this earlier. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'll turn it over to you. I apologize again for uh, cutting into your time, but uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much. Thank you. And honestly, I am delighted for any amount of time that I get with you here today. Um, this is a big topic, uh, exciting times, and uh, all of your updates um, are, are frankly uh, 
a good lead in to the importance of what we're going to be talking about today. Now, uh, in order to prepare for today, I uh, took the opportunity to watch some of uh, your recent uh, Grand Rounds lectures and I was so impressed. Um, not only is this an intelligent, thorough, detailed uh, community, it really is a community and there's so much caring and uh, thoughtfulness uh, in all the ways that you um, interact with one another. So I thought you might be interested to know uh, that these are my parents, Wade and Marsha Wood, and uh, my mom uh, was a nurse, uh, both in the emergency department and in public health nursing. And my dad uh, was an engineer building power plants. And this is a photograph of them uh, from when we lived in the Bay Area. Uh, when I was a small child, we lived in Danville, California. And this is important for two reasons, not only uh, my Bay, Bay Area roots, uh, but also um, I have a long history of explaining why marketing uh, is important to very technological, logical, scientific fields like engineering and medicine. Um, having gotten a PhD in marketing, I'm a little bit of the black sheep of my family. Everyone else is an engineer. Now, I've been a marketing professor um, and a researcher for a long time, but about five years ago, I had the great good fortune of meeting your own Kevin Schulman, who uh, really did change the trajectory of my own research. So I met Kevin, and if you know him, uh, you know how persuasive he is. Uh, he told me that I should teach um, the marketing analytics class in his program uh, in clinical informatics. Um, oh, and congratulations on your uh, MSIM program as well. Uh, and so I did. And I, again, felt like I would be able to explain marketing, um, consumer behavior, and the ways that it could really be used to leverage um, health care uh, to improve the patient experience, to improve health, to improve well being. And I was uh, delighted to see um, that the, um, the very diverse audience within that program uh, really took to marketing. Um, and I think maybe in some ways more than they really thought they would. Uh, marketing is not a term uh, that carries a lot of status or respect um, in our community. In fact, a lot of people with PhDs in marketing um, refer to themselves as behavioral economists and, and that's understandable. So uh, the thing is though, is that while I was happy to have some impact on um, uh, these clinicians and uh, healthcare leaders, they impacted me so much more. I found out all the different ways in which decision-making, choice, satisfaction, experience, all the things that we study in my very multidisciplinary field are so relevant for really big decisions. Um, to study marketing about um, you know, the choice between one brand of peanut butter and the other is interesting, but maybe not you know, hugely important. But to study how somebody chooses either a medical solution versus a surgical solution is crazy important. So all of the projects that Errol mentioned um, have come out of talking with these bright students. And so we come to uh, the challenge today. Um, I think it was uh, Dr. Damros in uh, a talk recently said um, the one thing he really learned um, from his time um, uh, on the USS Roosevelt was, uh, if you're asked to lead, lead. So um, when the news was filled with uh, stories about how Americans um, were maybe not as excited about getting the vaccine as they, uh, uh, objectively should be, um, Kevin said to me, you know, we can do something about this. Uh, you've got a lot of um, information that could help. Uh, and so here we are, we worked on this project and this is um, the situation we face. Now these are Pew Research numbers um, from May, September and 2020. And what they show is that um, while the majority of Americans um, is interested in the vaccine, uh, a, a sobering uh, percentage are not. Now, that number has gotten a little better over time. Um, Bob Kaplan was uh, good enough to share some new numbers with me yesterday, and uh, he found that it was still, you know, a little over 20% were not interested in the vaccine. Now, some people might say, well, that, that's still good, right? Like, look at all the people who are interested, except for the fact 
that, look, if we get 100% adherence from everyone who says they are definitely, yes, getting that vaccine, and 100% adherence from all of those people who say, I'm probably going to get the vaccine, we still need 100% conversion and adherence from the people who say probably no in order to get to 81% vaccination rate, which is um, uh, akin to what Dr. Fauci has said we'll probably need to return to normalcy. Now, if we need over 80%, we're gonna have to carve into those definitely no's. We're gonna have to find some way to convert, persuade, and motivate uh, people who are already um, sure they're not going to do it. This is challenging. In fact, this is such a daunting communication and persuasion task that I would argue that is uh, similar to the daunting task faced by the people who created the vaccine in the first place. Now, the way they made that incredible scientific achievement was because they used existing research that gave them a, a foundation to build on for this new COVID vaccine. And so what I wanna argue is that we need to build on the existing research in marketing and consumer behavior in order to achieve this great task in front of us. I want this uh, talk not to be uh, too sobering, not to be too overwhelming, but rather to be a source of hope. Now, I wanna start off by explaining just uh, exactly what my field is all about. So let me give you an example. Um, we all have seen the three different sizes of coffees at Starbucks, and it probably wouldn't surprise you to know that that middle cup is um, the most popular. Now, this is what's known as the compromise effect. It's a decision heuristic, just a little mental shortcut our brain uses to make choices. And it's not really irrational. In fact, it tends to be just our normal intuition of a normal distribution. Uh, we use it, you know, right? Like uh, choices on the ends of ranges tend to be extreme and choices in the middle tend to be more normal. And so we use that all the time as a shortcut to make choices. Now, I have found um, both with engineers like my dad um, and also sometimes uh, uh, clinicians like my students at MMCI that they say, oh yes, I see how people do that. And I say, no, 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 not people like those people, like you, like all of us. And they, my dad especially will say, no, um, I don't do that. I'm an engineer, I'm logical. And so I have found that to nip this tendency in the bud, what I do is I send out a survey before my course uh, and I ask people uh, you know, a lot of questions. And one of them is this little choice question. <clears throat> I ask them, imagine you have to buy a jar of artichoke hearts for a recipe. You go to the store, you don't know artichoke hearts. These are the three brands at the three price points. Which one do you choose? Now, knowing uh, what you know now about compromise effect, it is not going to surprise you that the one that's most often chosen is the middle brand, Reese. Now, this is all very interesting, but the other really important thing about the compromise effect that I want you to hear today is that it is both more prevalent when people are uncertain about the choice, and that's a lot of the time in medicine, and two, it suggests that you can nudge or manipulate choice by changing the range of options. So let's go back to that situation. Um, let's imagine that you uh, work for Delalo and you want that um, that brand of artichoke heart to gather more um, of the choice share. What can you do? One thing would be to lower the price to make it the middle option. As it turns out, that's not really a good choice. Or you could design a fancy new label, put a new um, brand on the shelf and give it a high price point at $4.99. Now your Delalo brand is no longer the extreme option in that range. And so half of the class sees that three option um, choice with the Lalo on the end. The other half of the class sees this range, the four option range with the Lalo in the middle. Now, remember, the Lalo was 22% before. Now it's 41. That's a huge jump. And in marketing, in the marketplace, you know, if you were the CMO, you would get a, a bonus. You'd make a lot of profit by that one simple action. However, how much more important is this when it's not about you know, market share in the grocery store, 
but it's you who have a public health initiative and you move 22% of the people participating to 41% of the people participating. Or you are a clinician and you move um, uh, your patient population from 22% adherence to 41% adherence. Now the profit is instead patient health and well being. Um, so that's why, to me, this is so exciting. Now, this doesn't mean that um, Starbucks um, and other people don't make mistakes sometimes. Starbucks did. It introduced a smaller cup of coffee once. That was disastrous. Um, and they learned a lesson. The next time they introduced a new cup size, it was larger. So here we see that this really matters to medicine. Now we can see it all over the place. I often think of it when I choose my health insurance for the year. There's Duke Basic, Duke Select, and Duke Options, and they go just like that down the line. Um, the amount of services is traded off by the amount of money. Um, and every year we choose the middle option, Duke Select. Uh, also, I often think of it when I'm at the doctor. So luckily uh, my family practice doctor knows me well, but recently I went to see her and um, I was concerned about something that looked a little weird to me, acted a little weird to me. And so I showed her, told her, and she said, look, I see what you mean, but I honestly don't think it's a problem. Um, now we could uh, look into it more, um, but that would require an invasive um, and costly surgery that has side effects of its own. Uh, risks of its own. Or we could just do watchful waiting and keep an eye on it. She offered me two choices. And it was miserable, right? Either I could be the person who was wasting society's money with this unnecessary treatment, or I could be the person who totally ignored my own health and somehow died a terrible, terrible um, death because I had not trusted myself. Um, these two options sounded extreme and awful. So um, I had a talk with her and I said, here's how I, I think you could have presented it to me. You could have said, I see your, your concern. Um, I don't think it's uh, gonna be something serious. Um, and we have three options. You could have it, we could have it looked into, but that would require an invasive surgery with costs and side effects of its own. We could assume that I'm right and just ignore it and go on with our lives or we could do watchful waiting, which means that we set an appointment for four months from now. And in that time, you watch it and you write down anything it does that's different or changes. And then we reassess. That made me feel so good about watchful waiting. It was the normal, middle, compromise, moderate, sensible thing to do. So think about that. Think about how it impacts masks. Now, masks are a situation that, frankly, we didn't handle as a country very well. Um, when uh, it came to discussions in the summer about whether professors would wear masks on campus, <laughs> back when we thought we'd be on campus, silly us, um, this was a big topic. And so um, a professor was very, you know, some professors, let's see, here's our, here's our <laughs> uh, professor hero. Um, should she wear a mask? Well. At first, it, they said, okay, well, you could wear just, you know, a fashion fabric mask of your own choosing, or we could give everyone masks that are kind of like this triple seal and have this little filter. Um, and again, people are like, uh, masks, still a lot of grumbling. But then we could have had it presented to us as well. You could wear a mask or we could put you in face masks, full face masks. And then I was like, oh, okay, visors, plastic visors. Or we could have plastic visors with the cloth face masks, or just full on hoods, full on medical hazmat hoods. And it was at this point that suddenly that just simple mask option doesn't seem so extreme. It does, it's, it's literally the least that professors can do to ensure the health of the classroom. And so grumbling goes away. But that wasn't the only thing about masks, was it? Masks were touted on utility, so easy to wear, so cheap, really effective. Um, but it boiled down not only to framing, uh, like the compromise effect, but just also to cultural identity and meaning. So for some people, oh, and we, if you remember, we weren't doing a great job with masks. 
Um, some people, though, when they wore a mask, they felt like a superhero protecting society. Other people felt like a mask made them feel like a weak and vulnerable, like they were sick. And so that played into it. Now, uh, at Stanford, obviously, you guys know a lot about design thinking. And design thinking says before you develop products and services, you got to really empathize and define the situation before you start ideating solutions. I um, mean, a lot of people say, well, empathize and define what? And so that's where this thinking from consumer behavior comes in. So there's the logical utility of something like the efficacy of wearing a mask. Then there's the role, the next layer of heuristics and how you see your options presented to you, like the compromise effect. And then there's culture and there's all the social personal meanings that different actions have. And that's like um, your feeling of being either um, a patient or a superhero, sick or strong. And that is what consumer behavior is. That's why I think this solution to um, our issues around vaccines are so important. So let's use consumer behavior theories to address the most important persuasive campaign of our lives, COVID-19 vaccination. And it's a sign of the times that when I typed this, it did not in any way feel um, uh, extreme to me. Uh, it felt like a perfectly accurate statement of our situation. And so that's where Kevin and I come into the picture. Now, the red and blue state's title today may have told you that we're going to be looking at identity segmentation, and in some ways we are. Um, and there is some evidence that red states and blue states or Democrats and Republicans have different feelings about um, the vaccine. Uh, interestingly, Republicans early on felt like the, um, they were less likely to feel like the vaccine was going too fast, uh, more likely to think that it was uh, going too slow and delaying access to the vaccine. But uh, again, thanks to Bob Kaplan, who uh, shared some early findings with me yesterday, uh, it is true that there are political um, identity uh, motives here. So he noted that um, a really key factor is whether people think the election was stolen, the presidential election. Um, and of those who do, um, almost half uh, will not get the vaccine, say they will not get this vaccine under any circumstances. But we make a real mistake if we boil it down to that duality. Um, and I think that's the mistake we made with masks. Uh, that, that is a reason, but it is not the only reason. In fact, it's not even the one of two reasons or three reasons or four reasons. There are many reasons um, why people are vaccine hesitant. So if we go back to this idea of um, looking at these different groups, if we look at it from a marketing lens, what we see is that there are four segments here. We have our very Interested segments are probably interested segments, are probably not interested and are definitely not interested. And what that tells us as marketers is that we can use what we already know about marketplace decisions to say how we need to motivate and make sure that people follow through who are in each of these current segments. And there are different things to do. So it moves everywhere from um, promoting the accessibility and ease of vaccines and promoting post-vaccination word of mouth for the people who are definitely yes, all the way down to how do we tackle the very difficult, definitely no segment. Um, the important role of avoiding judgment, finding narratives that allow people to change their mind without loss of face, all the ways that we can tackle that more resistant segment. And so that's the good news here is that marketing offers ideas about all of this. Now, if you look at all the things to do here, you might feel very uh, overwhelmed. I mean, shoot, you're just trying to get the logistics of getting people the vaccines done. I mean, it's, it's hard to, as a clinician, be now worrying about this kind of stuff. And yet I don't think it's that different from what you already think about. So if you think about sort of a precision uh, medicine mindset, that's what this is. It's like precision communication. Uh, not only are products and services developed with really uh, small segments of people in mind. So it's not just regular Cheerios, it's Honey Nut Cheerios. And it's not just Honey Nut Cheerios, it's Honey Nut Cheerios Medley Crunch. And it's not just the Honey Nut Cheerios Medley Crunch, it's the Honey Nut Cheerios Medley Crunch in the family size box. 
I mean, that's a really particular segment. And so that's what this is. This is just being really mindful about different groups of people and trying to identify them. And so um, what Kevin and I have come up with are 12 behavioral factors that are gonna be really influential in the ways that you talk to people um, about the vaccine and how we promote it, both at kind of mass um, channel levels um, and also just in one-on-one -on -one interactions. Now, I want to uh, very briefly in the time that we have go through some of these. So the compromise effect is a really clear one, right? We, we understand like make vaccination a middle option, avoid that two option choice. And so you want vaccination to seem like the compromise effect. Now this might require you to sit down and think about some different phrasing that you could use. So if you were thinking about how um, a doctor could talk to a patient, you could say something like, well, what do you think? Are you gonna get the vaccine now or later at your annual checkup or not get it? Obviously though, not getting it is an extreme option and one I don't recommend. Right, make getting not getting the vaccine the extreme option. Um, or you can give them lots of options, but again, it's keeping the vaccine in the middle. You know, you could wait a bit, you could get it this Friday, and you could get it now, or you could wait till summer. That even makes just waiting to get the vaccine more of an extreme option. Again, it's up to you knowing your own populations to work on the phrasing here to find what resonates with your particular group. Um, I think that especially when you're looking at employees of healthcare organizations, uh, you don't even have to say all of the options. So obviously not getting um, a COVID shot is an option, but you can also say, please get your COVID vaccination as soon as possible. And also consider getting your vaccination and donating blood. Again, you're just trying to make that just getting the vaccine now to seem like the middle option. Another um, way we can look at this is to leverage na natural scarcity and increase observability. So natural scarcity tends to make people more interested um, in getting things, uh, makes them worried that they'll miss out uh, on these scarce goods. Um, obviously, we don't want to make <laughs> the vaccine scarce, but we can leverage these early days of natural scarcity. And um, as uh, the iPod uh, has taught all marketers, making things observable helps people see their community make choices for innovations. So here, what we wanna say is don't waste the opportunity of these first weeks of scarcity. Don't just fixate on the logistical baubles, but really use that sense that these are the first precious vaccines. And make sure that when you're talking to your employees your uh, colleagues and your patients, make that early access a symbol of national value, like an award or a veneration. Um, make the vaccine and the reason for getting it observable. So if you're talking to a firefighter, you can say, you are so important to our society. Without you, our communities are in big trouble. That's why we all want you to be one of the people who are, get these first precious vaccines. Or you might say to your older patients in a nursing home, I'm so proud our country wants to vaccinate our veterans first. Without you, we wouldn't be here. That's why we all want you to be the person to get this first. Or maybe you wanna show your patients that as a clinical um, community, you're doing this. So you might say uh, at your own practice, look, all of our clinicians and staff are wearing a gray lifesaver bracelet to show they've received both doses of the vaccine. And I picked gray and yellow because interestingly, Pantone chose two colors as their color for the year for 2021 because it just goes to show how complicated 2021 will be. I guess we need two colors, one of them being gray. Um, but it does make for a really snazzy looking bracelet. Another thing we need to do is to use analogies and neutralize the base rate fallacy. Normal adults still have trouble with medical terms, even just more complicated words. Um, normal adults still have trouble with complicated calculations like trying to assess probabilities and assess risk. Um, US literacy and numeracy um, indicates that we might have trouble 
with a lot of the communication that is around the vaccine. And so one thing to realize is that that's not talking down to people to, um, to say that they have trouble. It's simply understanding where people might be astray. Another thing is that people give disproportionate weight to cases over base rates when they're thinking about things that are complicated like statistics. That's why people still play the lotto, even though the base rate is absolutely terrible. They have, they see on the news, the one case of someone winning and that's more persuasive than the base rate. And so what do we do here? Here we need to um, create and practice a list of analogies and stories that help explain statistics and processes and do share stories ad nauseum. So if you want to uh, explain the risk around getting uh, COVID after being vaccinated, find something else that's, a, that's an accurate uh, risk, but that is also sort of symbolic of something quite rare. Like, uh, would you get COVID after um, both doses of the vaccine? Well, you'd be, frankly, you'd be more likely to die in a car crash. Um, or how does mRNA work? Well, it works like an instruction manual, but your body actually reads them, unlike you. Um, or <laughs> maybe you say it's kind of like injecting a martial arts instructor into your body. It teaches your cells and your body how to fight off those crazy proteins um, so that later on, when the if the virus shows up, it's like, oh yeah, I'm ready. I know this, I've been trained. And that works. Now, I took this from the Stanford website um, and in my last minute, I can just point out that I saw this word recipe and I thought, awesome, there's gonna be a recipe analogy, um, but it didn't go that way. And even for somebody with a PhD, I got to the word anti-genicity and kind of stopped reading there. So lastly, I wanna say, make sure you share stories ad nauseum. There are gonna be so many stories about people who have bad reactions. Um, and if you want to see that, just go to Twitter, type in bad reaction to COVID vaccine and read thousands and thousands of people who are literally anxious about the different stories they're hearing. And so you need to combat that as much as you can. So take your landing page um, for Stanford Medicine and consider pasting on a running ticker, a sliding um, set of renewing stories that are all about real people excited um, about their stories and sharing what it was like. Now, I see that the time is, um, uh, is at nine o'clock. Errol, I'm gonna let you tell me, do you want me to continue? Yeah, we're gonna go until at least 9.15. Uh, thanks to Dr. Harrington for making some changes. So please keep talking and I'll, I'll look through various questions as they pop up, but thank, please keep going. Thank you. Okay, cool. Well, I appreciate that. And um, I'm hopeful that many of you can stick with us. And uh, if not, I know that there's gonna be a recording. All right, great. So what this is to say is that all of these 12 behavioral factors um, that we've talked about can be put into this kind of prioritization framework and look at attacking um, misinformation and hesitancy from a number of different angles. But what they all have in common is this sense of looking for individualized small segments that have you know, similar, um, similar characteristics, if you will. So what do you do today based on this talk? Well, for all medical personnel um, who uh, are seeing this, the first one is listen to your populations. Your population in California will be different from populations I may talk to in North Carolina. Um, your populations in a nursing home might differ from populations you see um, in a, a different clinic. So listen to your populations for those hurdles. And then start, if you will imagine, bucketing them. Uh, I borrowed this uh, term phenotypes. Um, categorize your phenotypes. Like what are the different reasons you're seeing? And watch that you don't do it just on kind of like the standard demographic stuff, just on gender or um, income or um, education, but really look for the motivation. What is motivating people? And then uh, I think it would be good for you to start choosing your compromise framing um, to kind of practice writing out some of those uh, little scripts that you could use with patients so that you can frame the vaccine as a middle option. 
and ditto practice how you talk about um, uh, to phase one and phase two recipients. You know, how do you make them feel special and honored? Um, and how do you make it clear that they're not jumping the line, that if they're strong and young, if they're a, a first responder or an essential worker, we're saying as a country, we need you to go first um, because we need you. Um, if you're talking to vulnerable older people, again, sign of respect, sign of love, sign of value. Um, make sure that if you get an observable token, um, whether it's a digital badge on your social media um, or a physical sticker or pin or a bracelet, wear it, do it, get out there, be observable. Um, social media is flooded with misinformation and with people sharing concerning things, anxious making things. You know, we, we tend to um, gravitate to negative information. So even if it seems sort of mundane, put a little bit of positive information out there. So share your story on social media, not necessarily the statistics. I mean, like watch out that you don't become the clinician who um, counters every worried uh, story from a patient with just more facts and statistics, counter with your own stories. And again, be active on social media with positivity, with heart. What do you do if you are um, an organizational leader? Um, in this situation? Well, first of all, train your people in these factors, right? Um, also, don't think that you're coming up with the phenotypes. Make sure you're looking to all of your uh, different leaders within your organization for them to bring the phenotypes up as a grassroots effort to you. Maybe consider creating a repository for content for compromise framing, analogies, and language around scarcity. Right? Those are things that maybe everyone doesn't have to um, reinvent the wheel for themselves, but um, things that they find work can be passed forward. You're going to need to design and order observable tokens. You're going to need to include the heavy use of stories with your stats. Um, and you're going to have to encourage your people to be active on social media, um, again, with being positive. And so what we see here is that there's a lot to do, but I can promise you from a field that has been looking at um, how to influence choice for more than 100 years, these things are effective. Um, and they may be a little outside what we normally do for public health communication. Um, the situation we're in now um, requires that we, we think a little further afield. And the nice thing is, is that once we have gone through this experience, once you have seen how these kinds of factors and tactics work for you and modify them to your own use, um, they're gonna to become tools for the future. Uh, what I've found in the last five years and what I believe firmly is that all of the knowledge from the field of consumer behavior and marketing, how we look at choice, how we look at experience, how we look at satisfaction, it's all going to bring us new tools to consider future healthcare issues, challenges, and opportunities. Um, and one very obvious example for me is another project uh, with Kevin Schulman, uh, a Stanford business case that we wrote together on how Amazon Alexa might be used um, to increase patient engagement um, in the digital uh, healthcare future. There are just so many interesting opportunities where patients' attitudes um, and patients' feelings about sort of uh, just the logical utility of something um, are really a broader representation of that, that layered onion that I presented before. Utility, heuristics, framing, environment, context, social meaning, personal meaning, in groups, out groups, it's all um, going to be something that can help us in the future. And so I hope, I hope that once the vaccination goal is achieved, once this is behind us, that we can continue this conversation about how marketing and medicine can work together for good. So what is next? Um, obviously vaccination goals first, but then what can you do? I mean, like well, maybe listen to a podcast um, on marketing every now and then or consumer behavior, behavioral economics. Um, check out the marketing ledger. We have a lot of work that is published on healthcare choice and satisfaction. And it may be a little, um, radical, but maybe there should be a marketing class in med school. 
Well, honestly, thank you so much for the time you've given me. Um, I know we've been brief, so please, please feel free to email me with further questions, joint project uh, suggestions, whatever you like, or follow me on uh, Twitter, or um, go to the Journal of Consumer Research and look at some of the free resources that we have there. Uh, with that, I don't know that we have time for questions, but I really would love it if we did. Absolutely. Dr. Wood, I think you drastically affected how I practice medicine in the future. This was really, uh, in, really interesting uh, and exciting stuff to see. Um, I don't think it would be um, crazy to have a marketing class basically after this, hearing what you had to say about this as well. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. And again, sorry for, for rushing you with time. Uh, we do have questions popping up. I'd like to get into a few of them. Uh, Dr. Mendoza, uh, who's given us a really great grand rounds earlier last year about um, the, the effect of culture and diversity on, on COVID, asks, how does marketing change with populations with different languages and cultures and diverse populations? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, one of the things I love the best about consumer behavior is it's multidisciplinary. So we have um, a lot of professors in marketing who have PhDs in anthropology and sociology um, and in kind of very macro, um, kind of they have a very macro perspective about what impacts choice. And so the thing is, is that all of the cues that we use to signal um, everything from you know our backdrops to the language we use to the way we um, uh, control our environment or the choice environment, all of those cues um, have can have different meaning to different cultures. Um, so going first can feel like status, being at the front of the line, or it can be it can feel like being a guinea pig. Um, being, you know, taking, <laughs> going first. I have a seven-year-old daughter who's very risk averse. She does not like to go first on anything. Um, and I think that based on your cultural experience, either of those analogies or metaphors are gonna be more prevalent in your mind. So um, when you have to understand your population, um, that's why I say don't, you know, big organizations, you don't think about, you know, who these phenotypes are. You let it come up from um, your people you know, your boots on the ground to tell you uh, what they're hearing so that, that the voice of the patient is really strong. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Harrington, uh, Dr. Wood, you didn't get to meet Dr. Harrington. He was in another meeting, but he popped on. I'd like to uh, cue him to ask a question. So Dr. Wood, first off, thanks for uh, visiting us virtually. We wish that you could be here with us on campus, but maybe in the, in the future. Um, my question is building on that last one, which is to bring together um, identity segmentation and celebrities. How do we, there's been a lot of talk about using celebrities in the campaign for vaccination, and maybe those would be different in red states, blue states. Do you want to talk about the use of celebrities in, uh, in marketing? Uh, honestly, you couldn't have asked me a better question because I recently published a paper <laughs> on uh, celebrity effects in uh, mammograms. And so looking at 20 years of data um, from the CDC, what we found was that um, uh, celebrity breast cancer incidence um, was actually not impactful on mammograms, um, contrary to what people thought of with, you know, sometimes they call it the Angelina Jolie effect and whatnot. But here's the thing, is that it wasn't the cancer incidence, the, the, the celebrity having it, it was the number of news stories about the celebrity's cancer that changed mammogram rates and changed them really radically. Um, so it's not that people believe celebrities more, uh, it's that celebrities keep choices top of mind. So um, if you think about it from the mammogram standpoint, you know, I need to get a mammogram. I know that I'm just busy, I'll get around to it. I know it's important, I'll get around to it. If there's a celebrity in the news with breast cancer and that's popping up in my newsfeed over and over again, I remember to make that appointment. And honestly, for all of those people who say they definitely will or probably will get a vaccine, that's important, right? Like, again, just you know that idea of adherence, getting those people to make the actual appointment is a job in itself. So celebrities can really help with that, right? It just keeps it top of mind, like, oh, that's right, gotta get to that. A celebrity might not convince the person who's you know completely against it, but they will keep it um, as a salient behavior, makes it observable. That's it's it's really nice because in a way it says uh, celebrities can help, 
um, but really they're not they're not taking your job, right? Like they're they're not convincing people about medical advice. Dr. Wood, um, uh, Julian Twiggs asked, there's a lot of uncertainty about the vaccine side effects, efficiency, efficacy, microchips, which you say can be easily found in places like Twitter. How do we get people away from this anecdotal evidence or rumors to convince them that they should not be concerned with things like this? Well, um, that is something that I don't have data on, but I have, um, I have some theories to lean on. And what I would recommend is that you don't fight anecdotes with statistics because we know anecdotes are so powerful for people um, and statistics are so cold um, that even though we as scientists say, this is the more objective you know, piece of information you can trust, you gotta look for the story they can trust. So I think you gotta counter story with story. Um, it should be a story that's obviously in line with statistics. Um, but, uh, you know, if people say, you know, look, I'm really worried about, um, you know, getting this because um, I'm allergic to dental anesthesia, you know, you being able to say, oh, I have a patient who had the same situation and they got their vaccine last week and they did great. Um, you'll probably stay a little longer just to make sure nothing happens. Um, again, taking stories and countering them with stories, uh, I think is your best bet. Excellent. Uh one here mentioned uh, you, you can't wear the badge, I got vaccinated when everyone else around you hasn't been offered the vaccine yet. It makes them angry, generally even angry because they talk about being uh, asymptomatic carriers or spreaders. Any, you talked about this a lot. There's this different mindsets of people getting vaccinated, which I found really interesting too, because I struggled with that as well. Um, any additional co comments to that, uh, to that comment? Yeah, I think that's where the observable has to be really clear why you got it. So it has to say, you know, um, you know, frontline hero, um, medical personnel, firefighter, police, like something that says, this is the reason why I have this. Um, it's, it's amazing how, uh, you know, for many people who aren't at the front of the queue, I'm at the very, very back of the line. Um, you know, I, I think to myself, oh, <laughs> what would it take um, to get up in that line a little earlier? But for people who are getting it right now, when it is so desirable, there's a little bit of guilt um, and maybe a worry that if you're out wearing, you know, you're observable, um, but, but don't worry about that. There will be some, there's, there's always gonna be someone who um, takes it amiss, but there are gonna be, you know, 20 other people who see it and go, oh, okay, I, I see people are getting vaccinated and that's a good sign. I heard of uh, one of my neighbors down the street just got vaccinated and honestly, it made me think, oh, Great, this is real, this is happening, not just on the news. Uh, Dr. Wood, one last quick question. Uh, it was quick, but uh, drug companies, are they good at marketing? Is there anything we can learn from them? <laughs> well, I have to admit that um, early in my career, um, some of my consulting work was with pharmaceutical companies. So um, I apologize if I was too good um, at teaching them stuff. Um, <laughs> oftentimes they are. Honestly, that's just like any other companies um, in the marketplace. Uh, some are just top notch and have been doing it right for a long time and others, uh, th that's not something they've learned about. Um, I think it was Dr. Barron who said in one of your, um, uh, one of your uh, grand rounds recently, it's not something I knew I needed to know, but I did. Um, and I, so I think some pharmaceutical companies come to realize that they've got, for, I think for pharmaceutical companies, they need to realize they've got three different decision makers that they have to have a different value proposition for each one. A, a specific value proposition for the patient, a specific value proposition for the prescribing clinician, and a specific um, uh, value proposition for um, the payer and how you know how you're uh, rated on formulary. So those aren't always the same. So when you see a, a, a pharmaceutical company having a different message to those different decision makers, I think that's a, a quick way to go to know whether this is a savvy. Um, a savvy uh, pharmaceutical company. And well, yes, I, all those little giveaways, they really do work. Well, Dr. I remember Wood, back in the day. 
No, th this is really great. And, and I really, uh, I, there's been a lot of comments, just thank you for an, an excellent talk. Uh, and I, I expect I'll hear a lot of great stuff throughout the day and week about this. We're definitely planning to invite you back. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you for Dr. Shulman, I forgot to mention earlier for connecting us and all the great work you guys are doing together. And uh, again, thanks again. Um, if there's any additional questions, uh, I'll, I'll send out to you to get answered. And thank you for everybody for sticking around and uh, have a great rest of the week. Thank you. All right, bye-bye.